This event, uh, amongst being supported by so many um, different groups, is also being supported by the Victorian Multicultural Commission. Um, my mother is one of those uh, Victorian BMC commissioners, and we have the pleasure of having another uh, African BMC commissioner, Mr. Sisei Dinku, who, who will address us shortly. Unfortunately, Ms. Helen Kapilos, who is the BMC chair, was unable to be here. So can you please make give a warm welcome to Mr. Sisei Dinku? First of all, Dr. Mimi for organizing such wonderful event and the gathering all of us together and the congratulations and the applause for that. For every success and um, for a man or for a woman, someone behind and um, for Dr. Mimi's success, it is a man behind which is really successfully supporting and the us all you. behind. Dr. Watt, please go. As Councillor Catherine said, Footscray is home for all applicants and the nickname for um, Footscray is... Did anyone know the nickname for Footscray? No. Africa. No. No. <laughs> so, I think today is the reflection of all of us that live in these beautiful states and Victoria as well as um, Footscray as community members and also even where we are also settled and working day to day. And saying that, I would like to acknowledge the traditional Cantorian of this land and pay my respect to them, their culture and their elders, past and present and the future. I also acknowledge all the guests in the house and also speakers, as well as all community leaders and the media groups and volunteers for this special event. I am honored to join you this morning celebrating African women, their voices. The chairperson Helen Kaplos would like to say, her sincere apology has not been with us today, but wish you a successful summit field with good conversation and the making new friendship today. I would like to congratulate the African Diaspora Women <coughs> Summit and all its volunteers who have been the head and soul of bringing this event together. African Women Victoria, today I would like to acknowledge the wonderful, strong and resilient women who make up our incredibly diverse African diaspora. As you know, many of us in different regions, different locations, working together in collaboration and partnership, and especially African youth, and particularly what they are really contributing to us, empowering and supporting, and also giving a lesson to their family, is incredible. And we respect and support those young newcomers and also graduates who are born here, born here and supporting them with other service providers and the community leaders as well. I've seen firsthand how passionate and determined these women are in wanting to make their communities more stronger, united and better represented. These inspiring women have ex exemplary role models not only in their own communities but across the wider communities, in particular in celebrating different cultures and the music and participating in communities, young Africans are today contributors and also multicultural African, multicultural Australia and wider space in different regions, in different states. Especially in art and the culture and the music, um, we know all contributors are really uh, supported by many, many service providers like multicultural art, Victoria, who are bringing communities together and celebrating their achievement. Thank you for that, Jim. This inspiring woman our society has been enriched by each of you, and you are all testament in Victoria strength and successful and living harmonious and multicultural society where we live. I'm proud to celebrate with you and acknowledge the exceptional contribution of women from African diaspora have made and continue to make in Victoria in diverse ways. I've had plenty of amazing opportunities to connect with women use from the African diaspora, some who have shared many of personal stories. Stories of tragedies, stories, stories of trauma through the past adversity and the challenge they have been through to get to Australia. 
The ch challenge facing African women in Victoria, there is no doubt many African women have experienced discrimination from cultural, religious, such as ethnic names and appearance in various levels that issue has been widely spoken and also we can see um, representation in media more recently. For many of us, our newly arrived diaspora, a lack of English language proficiency and settling in the new home country as well as intergenerational issues can be highly challenging. In fact, many, many people from culture are diverse, a lack of English language. And diverse backgrounds, including African Australians, have had to change their names in order to secure sustainable job in various levels. And then if they get a job, they may find workplace culture challenging to integrate towards them and the challenge because of the difference. <coughs> we know we need better training, more courses, better access to education, and internship, and support from the leaders from various sectors. In doing that, the Victorian government currently is really focused in terms of empowering African youth and women in various levels and support. Engaging strategic conversation about how to make a better life for African Australians, including African women and children, and one of the key drivers of the Victoria Multicultural Commission, which is really behind to support African communities to engage and settle in, Af in Australia. While creating dialogue and addressing these issues, a first step we must continue to work together in collaboration and partnership to work on ways to solve these issues so we can ensure every African Victorian woman has the same right and opportunity to live a life of what they deserve. Last year, the chairperson of the Victorian Multicultural Commission, um, Helen, was involved in community conversation <coughs> with a group of South Sudanese mothers in, in, in Middle West. Through this ongoing conversation, the VM was able to better understand the needs of Victorian South Sudanese community. Importantly, issues were addressed, and many of them found that there was a connection between the South Sudanese culture and the Australian culture, and the children needed to support in school and various activities where they are engaging. Another meeting the chairperson conducted last year with some inspiring African women found we need to do better to empower African women and young people across all spectrum. Some also felt their voices were not being heard. At the BMC, it's our job to not only find out what these issues are, but also to work together with the community, how to ensure that with community members is telling us gets translated into policy and actions. Following some of these conversations, the Victorian Multicultural Commission is really um, strategically applying different process to engage African communities to participate in act in actively. Young African Victorians, also featured in the film pro pro production by Swinburne University student that was screened at the Multicultural Festival as part of our BMC Swinburne Multicultural Film Project. The film titled New Change featured an Australian, uh, Afro-Australian youth group, New Change, who empower young women to connect with their culture and create change through artists and politics. Many of you participated and have seen these activities in the past. That is one of the empowering activities which is engaged. The BMC is a strong advocate in empowering and supporting women and want you to know that you have a voice and a hand talk to us about these issues concerning African communities. The VMC will continue to work on a range of initiatives to help support African women and children. And I want every woman here from the African diaspora to know the VMC is proud to stand with you every step of the way. And at any stage, we can do that. <laughs> so we continue to support and empower you in any possible ways through consultation, through discussion, and also learning from you to get your voice and take it to the decision makers. Because it's an empowered woman who can change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for that commission, Mr. St. 
Now, organizing the summit has been an intergenerational effort and is important for us that the youth in our communities remain engaged. I would like to invite some of the young people, such as Amanda Green, who's highly involved in the community, to have a little work with us, and is also such a role model. So please welcome her to the stage to give a little more. Good afternoon, everyone. How do you all feel? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. It has been an interesting journey of a few months, which feels like it just flew by. Um, a little bit about myself, I am actually an international student who, who has completed her studies. I'm waiting for my results, so I've completed my studies on Wednesday. So, an interesting journey. I came to Australia in 2013. I am from Zimbabwe. So it's quite a great opportunity when people look past where I come from in terms of being an international student and actually look at my capabilities as a human being and my passions about people instead of just where I come from or what my visa says or what my passport says. So that's really a good, that really encourages me to do a lot of things in Australia. Um, what have I done in Australia? Um, so I arrived here, as I said, in 2013, and I studied at La Trobe University. When I started university, there wasn't really much of a community, um, of an African community in La Trobe, and I felt that we were misunderstood. When I thought about this, I thought, okay, why are people asking me, why is your English so good? Oh, Africa is that country. I was like, I was offended. It, it took me a while because I was like, okay, is this normal? Like five times later, I was like, okay, this is clearly a problem. But I went and reflected upon it. I said, okay, all these people have said this to me. What have I done? Did I actually say no, Africa is a continent? Did I actually say no? I've been learning English since I was since I started school. No, I did not respond like that. So whose whose problem is it? I realize it's a two-way street. If I go somewhere and someone says, Oh, your English is so good, why am I not responding and saying, Oh, I am Zimbabwe was colonized by the British. I've been learning English since I started school. And I have three main languages and I'm fluent in all of them. Why am I not saying that? And I thought, okay, so it's a theme of education. We need to educate each other in terms of what is what is the truth. And I can't go and educate my fellow Zimbabweans about Zimbabwe. I have to educate other people. And I don't know everything about Africa. It's a big continent with 54 countries. Yeah. Especially 55 at the moment, but you get the point. <coughs> it's the second largest continent. So that pushed me to start an organization called A Look Into African Society at La Chaux University. Wow. And I'm happy to say Thank you. I'm happy to say it's not an organization that I started wanting my name to be updated. It's an organization that I started wanting to leave La Chaux University and go there five years later and see it still standing on its two feet. And I can safely say my successor is doing a great job and I have hopes that in the near future or how many, how many years I go later, it will still be there. And it's a look into African society because everyone in this room has the potential to teach someone about wherever they come from, whether it's Africa, whether it's Europe, whether it's America, wherever you come from, you have something to teach someone you have to just speak up and have that conversation with people. And as the youth, it is difficult to have that conversation with people because sometimes you're just like, is this, is this the right conversation to have with someone? I face difficulties because coming from my cultural background, it's really difficult. The first thing I had to learn was calling people by their first names. Like sometimes I still find people from my country, I'm just like, uh, is this auntie or do I call you by your first name? Such, such things really affect people because then you don't know how the relationship is meant to be with adults and I think that's another issue that we have in terms of breaking the barriers between 
the generations that we have because we don't know how to have that conversation with you or they don't know and you, or you don't have to, you don't know how to have that conversation with yourself i face this even with my own parents like i sometimes i'm like am i allowed to have this conversation with my mother i have been in australia for a few years i see my friends having these conversations with their parents but is it is it appropriate for me to do that or is it disrespectful and i think for all the parents in this room i think <coughs> It's a good thing to reflect upon that, that sometimes we want to talk to you, we just don't know how far we can take it. We don't know how great the conversation is going to go. We don't know how you're going to take it. We really do not want to disrespect you, but we want to say, no, these are our passions, this is what we want to do. Personally, I did not tell my mother I started an organization in Australia. Personally, I did not tell my mother I couldn't find a job and instead I'm opting to volunteer because I enjoy volunteering. I enjoy helping people. I did not tell her that. I only told her when I won an award because I knew she would be happy. <laughs> My mother was going around preaching about aliens. She was going around, she was telling everyone, oh my gosh, my daughter did this. Now when I tell her, oh mom, I'm going to a conference, I'm going to this, she's happy. But if I, I feel, if I had told my mother, okay, I can't find a job, but I'm volunteering, I'm doing this, I'm very passionate about this, she would not understand. That is a sad reality, not because it, we're not doing something important, but because it's a lack of understanding, it's an issue of how do we communicate this to you. So, as everyone in this room, I urge you to have that conversation, whether you are, you, have, you want to have this conversation with your parents, or your parents trying to have this conversation with your children. It is important because the youth are the future of tomorrow. I believe in youth and power because if we are not doing anything to change this world, the future is looking very dim for all of us. And women also have a struggle. Being a woman who started this organization, a young woman at that time was 19, leaving people who were five, 10 years older than me, looking at me like, what is this little girl saying to us? <laughs> it was offensive. I've been, I've been attacked left, right, and center. I had to be strong. I cried. I wanted to give up. I almost gave up. But I had friends, I had people who said, no, follow your dreams. This is something that needs to be done. And I did it. And it has helped a lot of people. And I hope it has inspired other people. University, I am happy to say I will continue doing the things that I like. I will continue helping people and advocating for youth empowerment and also trying to encourage people to have that conversation with their parents. I will also be trying to obviously have better conversations with my parents, baby steps, but you have to start somewhere. The youth are the future of tomorrow, and this room is an indication that we should do something. We're going to try and do something to have this empowerment spoken about, and especially women as well. Not just women, but women and men, but please talk to your children. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Amanda. You look really relate. I'm following your dreams. I told my mom that I want to become a model. She looked at me and she's like, oh my doctor, what are you doing? <laughs> I want to do poetry as well. She's like, read a book. <laughs> that's, how, that's what I'm doing. I'm educating myself to write this. But it's, it's just the, the understanding of communicating with them and just giving the message how they can understand it that this in this day and age, that this is something that we're all trying to achieve at the moment. We have plenty of opportunities, why not take that and make a difference for our community? Now, I would like to invite another special guest, an Australian footballer, yes. Mr. Natalie Ward. He is highly involved with the community and he's going to speak in the importance of youth engagement for young Africans in the diaspora, particularly the engagement of young African men. He's also such a role model, and please welcome to the stage. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's quite an honor to be amongst you guys, you know, it's to be part of this great initiative, you know, I'm very proud and I'm very honored to be here. Um, as, as, um, Amy, Amy? as Amy Green was saying, like, you know, uh, obviously youth are the future of this country and around the world, um, what, she's, what she's indicated is the fact that, you know, um, obviously we do need a lot of support from our parents and the other people, so you know, very honored to be here and I thank you for what you said. Um, my name is Nell Yawa and I, I'm at, at Cali at Collingwood Football Club and I also work with um, a non-profit organization, Afri Oscar. My role at that, um, that organization is, you know, I'm using what I've gone through, uh, uh, you know, as a trauma youth back in my day. Uh, and use that as a guide, as a pathway for young people to um, you know better themselves and you know, um, find a better way for them to get better in the future. Um, at the moment, you know, I use my story. You know, back in 2011, you know, I was a victim of a high-profile machete attack, um, and I, you know, I do remember vividly that I had about a one percent. Uh, I was told by the surgeon had a one percent survival. And I was told that I can never play football again. There's a lot of walk. Is that on? Yeah. 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 So, um, so I, I've used that as a as a adversity. Um, I've used that as a pathway for myself and to towards other young people that look, you know, whatever doesn't kill you, make you stronger. And you know, if, if I can, if I can recover from what I've gone through, um, you know, regardless of whatever you go through in life, you know, it's always free. It's always right at the end, end of the tunnel. And you know, I, I use that as a tool, you know, towards the younger young guys I work with as well as some other women that I also do with as well, you know. Myself I have seen first in hand all the hardship, you know, all the struggle all the human women go through. And you know, it's it's a testimony for myself and to others as well. So I'm very proud to be here and uh, I'm just, you know, I just look around the room and see a lot of great, um, a lot of high profile, you know, a lot of young talented young young girls, young women, young men as well. So, you know, it's, you know, you can always set your sights, set your set, set, sorry, set, set your goal high, you know, aim for what you want to become, you know, anything's possible. Um, and I do encourage a lot of, you know, mothers, a lot of fathers, you know, just encourage your kids and just, you know, trying to trying to maintain uh, sort of a, a friendship relationship between one another. Because I'm pretty sure, um, you know, growing back in Africa, that's, that's, that's what us, you know, us young people are really lacking. But if, if you can start now, you know, just, just create that bond. Um, just, you know, as, as, you know, as a daughter, as a, as a son, just, you know, make them your best friend. And I'm pretty sure um, that can go a long way. Thanks for having me, and yeah, I look forward to speaking. With, I look forward to speaking to every one of you at uh, this end of summer. Where 
there is an issue of not breaking through to establish that dialogue. What do you think should happen or is the role of your mom and your role to break that barrier? What do you expect? It might be better for you to come this way. Both of you. Because you have the role you So for me, I'm an, I'm an only girl, and I'm the youngest. So obviously, growing up in a household where it's male-dominated, and it's just me and my mother, the relationship was very much strained because I just always felt like, oh, you're the girl, you have to do this and that. And um, I must admit, my relationship with my mother was more, yeah, yes, mom, I'll do this, I'll do that. But um, moving here and being by myself, and just realizing the sacrifices that my mother made and the reason why she wasn't at home for me to have that relationship with her has opened my eyes to understand why she did the things that she yeah. did. And considering the environment that I'm in and the freedom I have to do whatever I want, I can honestly say without my mother's traditions, without my mother's um, strong will, without her power, without her strength, and all of the things that she did, if I had not grown up in that environment, I wouldn't be as a strong person as I am today. So I think in all honesty, it's about growing as a person. It's about that challenge of actually growing as a person. The older I get, the more I appreciate her and the things that she does. So having those conversations, it's still hard. It's I'm just hoping it will get better. So I think mothers, my advice to mothers is you should be patient with your daughters. And for daughters, you should really understand where your mom's coming from. She's been there and she's telling you things that she's experienced. Although it doesn't sound like that at that time, I would admit, I was there, I was like, no, mom, you have no idea what's going on in my life. You don't understand. But I think it's a matter of growth and just baby steps growth and baby steps and just appreciating each other as a family. So that's what I'm working on as a person. And we'll take one more question, just because in the interest of time for Yao. Yes? Okay, I'll, I'll be loud. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Mariam Itza and I'm from an organization called Resilient Aspiring Women and my question is for both of you but before I go to the question I just want to say how humbled and how proud I am of, your, of the work that you're doing as young people in this country and especially so I think the stories are very powerful in our African culture and it's really important that we share these stories and that the younger generation would learn from you once you have a bigger platform. Yeah. So my question to you is, how are you using technology? And how are you using your story to empower youth, not only from this country, but as a diaspora youth yourself, to have it wide and far, because we have internet everywhere in the world now. So are you using technology? <laughs> <laughs> you want to have the last say. <laughs> um, personally, I used to I used to like Facebook. I used to like Instagram and everything. The like, the older I get, the more I'm more conscious about privacy and where my information is. In regards to spreading the word about the work that I do, I made sure that Alias had a big platform where people know what's going on. I have my <laughs> friends in. Germany, in Namibia, the other day one of my friends in Namibia was telling me that someone from Australia was saying something about Avia, so I was like, you're lying. He's like, no, I'm serious. So I was like, okay, that's a good sign. I think just spreading the word and telling people what's going on in my life and having that conversation, because even though I'm here, I have friends who are all over the world, and just saying to them, you know what, it's hard. But you need, you need to be that person. Don't complain. You do what you were saying should be done. So 
So I think in terms of using media and social media, that's how I use that platform to actually post things rarely, but post things that are important that will actually shape someone's life because I'm like, okay, I've got now. Really, I don't need to be posting about drama and everything like that. I need to be posting something that's important and beneficial to someone. I only use my social media and the platforms to actually empower people to put stuff there that will actually build someone and help them grow as a person. I think that's the stage where, that I'm in personally. Some people could be there, some people can't. But that's how I use my media to help spread the word about what's going on. Thank you. And I'll go absolutely like any of what you said was correct. Um, um, in terms of myself, you know, trying to spread out, you know, the great work through my social media channel, you know, I'm privileged enough through uh, football and I've uh, got a high following and, you know, I try to use that as wisely as I can. And you know, also with my travel arrangement, you know, I do I do go to um, a few countries and um, try to use that, you know, um, as a personal personal experience and use that as um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you know, once again, you know, it's, um, using uh, social media is a great tool, and I do my best to try and push out positive um, positive words. <laughs> I use the word of, uh, myself to use the word of encouragement. And, yeah. cool. um, can we please just give a huge round of applause? To All right, I have one uh, one last question because I got asked this question um, before, and it was. Uh, someone was asking me about the summit and I was telling them what my role was going to be at the summit and then I told them that my co MC was going to be a young man and they're like, but well, why would you have a young male at, as co-host at a women's summit? So I can't really answer that question, so I'm going to throw it to you. <laughs> to be here to support us today, but he chose to be. Um, so yes, William, why are you a young man and seen at an inaugural women's summit? <laughs> 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 well, I do think that as much of it's more based on the female, young females of Africa and just African women, I really feel that it's important for young men such as myself to have an understanding of what's happening and very be to very get involved. So we say a lot about getting involved with the community, that's getting involved with this, not very having having a really section, very widespread, so everyone put your community your face out there for other people to understand, especially young guys like myself. I think it's very important for for us to educate. So I do poetry and I really understand where females come from. We came from a female, we should respect the female and that's the best part of life. I really feel, uh, my mom, she really raised me well, um, and she always taught me to respect a woman um, and just always hear them out. Don't be always that, that dominant person. Have an open ear. Um, and yeah, I guess that's, that's where it's coming from. <laughs> so, um, respect everyone and educate yourself. I think that's the part that I'm here for. Thank you so much. Just, um, I have my children were born here, and then I grew up in the village in Uganda. Yeah. <laughs> so what I would like to, to ask the young people that uh, we grown up, so all mothers or, and, and fathers, we grew up back home in the village. And we have that uh, village uh, bringing up by, by, the, by the village and the respect and all that. And say, my children were born here. But 
we are asking you young people also to, to develop a relationship with us, uh, to be able to communicate to us and say, look, because it has the mother or the father when they want to talk to you from school. We know you have a talk. Sometimes the issue is, how was school? Good. <laughs> that's like, uh, that's true. Uh, that, that's it. Oh, and then you sit on the TV. Uh, so that, there, there, there's no way of how I can communicate with you. Yeah. So it is a, a true way also to understand us and be able to say, Mom, oh, it wasn't easy at school. Or uh, can I talk to you later? Or oh, this is my daughter to say, oh, I say, oh, we use, can you do the dishes and do this and say, oh, this is not Uganda. I say, yes. There is a way that you can, how we can communicate and be able, be able to talk to the relationship. So that that's, be able to talk to us and then be able to communicate. So it is a two way yeah. of uh, adopting to the youth. Um, can I ask you a question? Um, are you happy to be here? Yes. We'll try one more time. <laughs> are you happy to be here? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> to here too. Um, before lunchtime, we have one more uh, speaker who was supposed to be speaking tomorrow, but due to his unavailability, he's kindly giving us his time today. So we have the principal of Malcolm Secondary College here, Mr. David Reynolds. And throughout this summit, we've been doing a lot of work in trying to make sure that we have as many voices, um, people of all experiences here to participate in this groundbreaking um, milestone that we're creating here. And Mr. David Reynolds has been a huge support. In fact, um, he has sponsored through his school a large group of students. I don't know if they're in the room, they'd like to stand up. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, David Reynolds, um, for actually facilitating that by sponsoring and inviting your students to be here. So please make them feel welcome. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. It really is a great privilege, um, and I and it is really uh, fantastic to see so many of Melbourne Secondary college students here in great numbers and they're very, very excited about being here. Um, I wanted to also just acknowledge that um, there are students from other schools here as well too and teachers and, uh, and numerous other educators in the room no doubt as well too. So I mean, we've been hearing from uh, voices from various sections of the community and uh, I think just following on from the terrific uh, last two speakers, the young people who are speaking, and, uh, and our hosts as well too. It's quite evident that uh, you know, so much of this work is about empowering youth, and, uh, and the work that we do as educators, of course, is all about that. Um, I just I wanted to sort of begin by outlining a number of things that some people in the room may not be aware of in terms of, of Melton. Um, it's, uh, it's on the outskirts of, uh, of metropolitan Melbourne, some 45 kilometres away from the CBD. It's one of the most rapidly growing areas of, of Melbourne. And, uh, and the school, Melton Secondary College being the, the first school in, in Melton, is also a rapidly growing school. So when I arrived there just over six years ago, there were 600 students or so. There are approximately 1,100 students there now. And probably four years ago, we would have had 20 students of African background, now we have 120 students. And I know that, that that's happening in, uh, right across that part of Melbourne as well too, and, uh, and various other parts of Victoria. So, look, I, I suppose um, the story that we have to tell um, about the work that, um, 
our school community <coughs> is doing is really about, uh, it's about realising the vision that we have and I know it's, it's a vision that um, will resonate with many people here. Um, we, we have a, a vision of uh, a community of learners which is a flourishing community and we really derive that idea from the idea that uh, education is about growth and for young people to be healthy and successful they need to grow as resilient young people <coughs> being able to meet adversity and overcome it and to prosper and to succeed. Um, we are all about high rates of learning and of course empowerment comes through education, the skills and knowledge to be uh, clear thinkers, analytical thinkers, creative thinkers and doers in the community and to be citizens who can uphold the rights and also empower the rights of other people in the community. And we want students who will leave the school with bright futures. So that work is really at the heart of, of what we do at our school. And it is about, firstly, for the families of African backgrounds at our school, about understanding the stories. And we've heard um, you know, various kind of speakers come up and talk about the importance of stories. And cultural understanding is a critical part of, of learning and education. And for us, the journey has been about uh, understanding the, the various stories and the cultural stories of our African families. And I'd have to be honest and say that for the first three years or so that I was there, that really, that understanding, that work was um, probably not as prominent in our thinking and as our priorities as it has become, and not just through dint of numbers and the increases I mentioned before, but also because of the um, the need to or meet the, 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 the needs and the aspirations of a, uh, a burgeoning, emerging community, part of our community. And some of the, those challenges really are about um, settling and, um, and helping <coughs> young people um, prosper and succeed through the, the challenges, many of the challenges that we've heard about today. And and also to overcome some of the, the kind of adverse perceptions that are in the community as well too. And, and it's, a, it's a complex, very challenging process for young people in the community. So it has been about, for us, it's been about partnering with other organisations in the community. Uh, Melbourne City Council is very progressive in this area. I know there are people here from the council. Our school's working closely with Melbourne City Council to develop that understanding programs in the area for young people of African background. Um, some of the, uh, the other organisations, Big SEG, uh, plays a very important part uh, supporting the Sudanese community, the South Sudanese community in our area, and we've been fortunate to benefit from collaborative work with them, particularly around the homework club that's been happening, not just at Melbourne Secondary College, but some of the other government schools in the area. And, and also with um, the, uh, the, the police in the area as well too. We had a fantastic uh, uh, African student and uh, uh, police basketball competition at <coughs> our school at the end of last year. And uh, a fantastic kind of opportunity for um, young people to get to know um, police officers in the area and for those relationships to be a positive one and I know that the students at the end of that had, uh, were feeling so much more uh, confident uh, in, in their conversations with uh, local men from the police force as a result of that. There are many other plans that we have on our list of things to do, and I don't think any of those will um, have a chance of, of coming to fruition without the work of two new members of staff and Robert Adua, who many of you may know, and uh, I can see he's kind of walking around the room now and kind of doing organising things. Robert uh, came to us last year as uh, uh, a community liaison officer, and he's been really instrumental to uh, much of the programs that we've been able to put in place at Melbourne Secondary College, and connecting, importantly, connecting with uh, our families and helping us to understand the staff of the college, to understand the stories of uh, our individual family members, and uh, but also for our parents to understand 
the way that uh, government schools work and the way that the community works and various agencies which uh, new people in the area have to navigate. And Robert is joined just this year by another um, uh, of our staff who's in the community as well, a quad, Martin Magier, and I think a quad is here as well too. So they have both been absolutely fantastic in the work that they've done, and uh, it is a hard task for me to actually try to hold them back in the work that they want to get out and do with it in the community and the amount of time that they want to spend bringing our African families uh, together in the school, bringing them into school, but also us reaching out into their homes as well too and doing the work of supporting young people that are our students. Um, I wanted to, I suppose, just sort of finish by again acknowledging the importance of young people. At our school, like most schools and probably all of them, you know, the work that we do to empower students is about students having a voice and being sure that uh, as leaders within schools we're listening to students, to what they regard as being priorities for themselves and in their learning, the best way that they can learn. In. Education learning happens so much more effectively when it's a partnership. And to acknowledge that um, there are not just many of our students here, but they are growing more active in our school community as well too. And uh, we, we've just set up, I think, under the uh, kind of leadership and initiative of Robert and Aquat, uh, uh, an African students club within the school. And uh, they're starting to reach out into uh, the community, find a great role model themselves. And I know that they're going to become more empowered and stronger voices within the student cohort at Melbourne Secondary College at the of it. So uh, perhaps if I could just finish off by thanking you again for the opportunity to just say a few brief things about the school and obviously the importance of schooling uh, in this uh, wonderful project that uh, this summit is launching, which is about empowering the voices that African women have and young African women at, uh, at schools in Victoria and Mountain Secondary College obviously have an enormous part to play and for us to achieve our vision of a flourishing community, it's, uh, it's critical that we listen to them as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for that, David. Before we go on any further, I would just like to say Yig Mubarak to my brothers and sisters, whether you celebrated yesterday or today, I hope you guys had a blessed day. Um, moving forward, um, can we get all the guest speakers that were speaking out on the podium today? to hand out a few things that we would like to give to you. So please come to the, down to the front for all those people that spoke today. While they are doing that, um, great to go ahead. So thank you so much. Um, can we give them one more round of applause? So the gifts that they're receiving are called Bags of Hope. Bags of Hope is a social enterprise started by a young, um, started by, yes, young at heart, I would say. Oh, sorry, <laughs> um, started by one of the women. Um, and it's basically about supporting those who do not have access to basically, so each of these bags of hopes is hand stitched and then it is filled with donations that are given to women who are in need, whatever their circumstance, whatever it is that they need at that time, each of those bags is um, filled with those. So that is why they're receiving those gifts today because we want as much of what we're doing here to be about empowering um, women and the voices of them. So any little thing that we can add to that is what we are doing. So uh, that brings us so close. Thank you. You're welcome to speak with me around 1.30 p.m. and we will begin our plenary um, sessions for the remainder of the summer.